Hello, and welcome to another episode of Bunk. We've got our beautiful Miss M, we've got Scotty, and then we have a wonderful special guest, Barb, who is here to talk about her addiction story. And this is Miss M's mom, so we're going to give it to Miss M. Thank you, Jess. Okay, so. Hello, um, pretty lady. How are you this evening? I love talking to you. I love talking to you too. I am so excited to share this journey with you. It's going to be so much fun. You say that now until I say something absolutely humiliating. The whole world knows that your mother did things like that. So we'll see. <laughs> this is a fully no judgment space. And so um, everything that you have to say is uh, fully welcome and embra just embraced for you. I love you so much, and thank you for asking me to do this. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight, and also I feel it is um, my duty as an alcoholic to uh, share my experience, strength, and hope, So, um, but if somebody else has or is reaching out for help, um, you know, that they know that there's somebody else out there that's gone through what they've gone through and that there is a way out of this horseshit. Absolutely. So just to start, how long have you been sober now? So I am uh, just a little over five and a half months. Um, I did get sober for about six months. To, at that point, I thought I was cured. Um, it turns out I actually was not. And uh, so I have started um, this latest journey. Uh, I did start it on December the 27th of 2017. Wow. 2017. So before you decided to get sober the very first time, how long have you been drinking for? I started drinking when I was 37. I, I'm a late bloomer. I think I am not the only one, um, especially uh, for moms, you know, who um, what we do is we raise kids and we're busy and we're busy and we're busy and we're busy until all of a sudden one day uh, at the age of 37, a glass of wine was introduced to me, or maybe I should say box of wine was introduced to me. And I just remember um, my shoulders finally dropping down for the first time. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I could do this every day after work. This would be wonderful. So um, that is when I started drinking was at the age of 37. Wow. So 37 and you are... You just turned 51. I, did, I just turned 50. You just turned 50. I turned 50 in December. Wow. Okay. So, so I drank remember... for eight years. I drank for eight years. Yeah. That's a long time. Well, do it's, it's not like... too bad. You know, men can drink a lot longer than women can. I do know of um, a lot of women who have, um, who have drinking, uh, you know, they can drink for decades, but the majority of women, uh, alcohol takes its toll a lot quicker and we get, over, and we either, you know, we have three options, death, institutions, or um, fine sobriety, so. Yeah, definitely. So I was just going to ask, do you feel like, how do you feel like your health had been impacted by being an alcoholic? Wow, I'll tell you what, um, health-wise, um, the most important thing to me when I was drinking was drinking, so um, there wasn't money for doctors or dentists because that all went to booze. I um, am now in the process of um, getting my teeth fixed. I have no back teeth on each side, and... Um, I get to go in and have some molds made in about two more weeks after the healing of the last three teeth I had pulled um, after that fully heals. Um, so as far as my health goes, there was that. There was also um, my weight got really low. Um, I've always struggled with my weight, and we can talk about all the addictions I had before I finally found my solution in alcohol at 37 years old. Um, but um, health-wise, um, uh, sleeping was really hard, um, not to mention um, the blackouts and the falls and the bumps and bruises and of um, 
just a toll, just a toll in general that it took on my body. Um, you know, we don't, part of my language, ladies, but we don't poop the same. Um, we don't, uh, um, I shouldn't say we, I should start talking for myself, so I'm sorry about that. But health-wise, I think that's probably the basics, just not taking care of my own, my needs um, um, physically. I wasn't, I wasn't working out. I mean, really, the, I was a, and I didn't drink in public most of the time, so I was really great at isolating. So there was no physical activity. There was just sitting at home, sucking on my bottle. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I can imagine the, the physical um, impacts that drinking for a long period of time can have. Uh, what about your mental health? Do you feel like you saw a pretty huge decline um, from the beginning of your drinking journey to the end? Well, the thing about alcoholism um, and alcohol itself is at a certain point, we tend to believe that the that the lie is the truth. So um, mentally, I I was able to put myself in a place of justifying drinking. You know, I could drink on a good day. I could drink on a bad day. I could drink when it was raining or I could drink when it was sunny. I could drink uh, when you were pissed off at me or I could drink when you were pleased with me. I could drink, um, you know, another thing is, is I drink a lot um, to get rid of feelings of, um, how I disappointed my children. And um, you would think that that would have eased the pain, but, you know, drinking is a depressant. And so really, it just really brings on more of um, the depression. And so I would get extremely emotional and extremely sobbing and, you know, knowing full well that I'm in alcoholism and that if I could just quit drinking, I could fix some of these things. But, um, you know, alcoholism being the, the disease that it is, my brain didn't doesn't um, register the concept of how to do that exactly uh, by, yeah. my, by myself anyways there wasn't um, there wasn't a cold turkey for me there wasn't a um, you know once we start drinking um, that starts up the craving and once the craving starts up then the obsession of the mind takes over and then it's all you can think about even when you're really trying not to drink all you're thinking about is how you can get your next drink when can you get it where are you going to hide it is anybody going to know can I just sneak out to the store do I have enough money am I going to have to steal it you know and this is a 24-7 um, not to mention you can't go to sleep and um, because your body has gotten so used to only being able to um, sleep, a.k.a. pass out, black out, brown out, you know, all of those things is the only way that you're going to get to sleep. And But that obsession of the mind is absolutely um, one of the one of one of the biggest, if not the number one reason why I won't ever uh, or why I won't pick up a drink today. I can't say ever. Um, but I know I don't have to worry about picking up that drink today. And um, that obsession of the mind is um, really a beast. I'll tell you what. Yeah. I can't imagine being as long as you have been sober now for five years. I mean, that is, that's an incredible accomplishment. But do you remember when specifically you realized that you had a drinking problem? <laughs> so I, I probably joked about being stuck on step one. I did uh, find recovery through Alcoholics Anonymous and step one says, um, admitted that we were powerless over alcohol and um, our lives had become unmanageable. So I knew fairly, uh, I'm, I'm going to guess it was probably two and a half, three months when after I started drinking, maybe six, you know, I wasn't aware. Uh, I didn't know I needed to be um, thinking, um, oh, I, I'm going to be an alcoholic. But, you know, as I as I look back and think about what was going on in my life and or what relationship I was in or going through, I'm going to say that it was probably within about four to six months after I started drinking that I didn't, that I knew that I, that I wanted to keep drinking, you know, it becomes, um, a way to, um, relate 
especially when I, you know, I felt like a girl who never fit in and uh, finally drinking and being around people. Um, I finally felt like I fit in. I could dance, I could sing, I was pretty. And if I wasn't, it didn't really matter to me what you thought about that. I hope I'm answering these questions because if I feel like once I get started, sometimes I forget what the question is because I'm old, guys. I'm getting old. <laughs> no, you are doing wonderfully. Um, and I really appreciate your vulnerability. It's really difficult to talk about these things because... Sometimes we feel embarrassed or ashamed of the things that we've done. And so um, I'm, I am just so grateful that you are willing to share your story and what led you down this dark road of alcoholism, but also what brought you back into the light and how, how you work at that every single day. Because from what I am to understand, you know, you can never truly be cured from alcoholism you know, I've asked you this and you have told me once an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic, whether you feel like you wake up even today and, and feel like you still want to drink or think about it. Or if you finally have had had days where it's not even a thought in your mind, you know, being able to hear everybody's individual stories is so important because nobody's one journey is the same and being able to hear different perspectives of of what led you down that path and what brought you out of it is really important for everybody to hear. Exactly. And well, um, I'll just, just oh, sorry. So sorry, darling. I just wanted to say, I think you're doing this beautifully and it's your story. So however you need to answer the questions, that's up to you. But I think you're doing beautifully. Sorry, I just wanted to say that. I agree. <laughs> Me too. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so just to touch a little bit, Emily, on um, about being um, embarrassment and shame and guilt. Um, I, I can honestly tell you, um, I don't I don't feel that way anymore. Um, and uh, the biggest reason why I don't feel that way is because I know there's somebody out there that's going to need to hear my story so that they can um, recover from this disease as well. And um, so I don't have guilt and shame about it. You know, it is my story. It is my history. Um, do I wish that it wouldn't have happened? Well, let me tell you something else about that. Um, uh, I am a grateful recovered alcoholic. And I'll tell you why I say grateful. Um, just because I didn't start drinking until I was 37 doesn't mean that I didn't act alcoholically long before I picked up my first drink. And um, so, you know, before there was alcohol, there was food. Uh, before there was alcohol, there was boys and sex and then um, husbands and children and shopping and um for me, every, you know, things were shiny for a short period of time, and then I needed to move on to the next shiny thing, whether that was um, having another baby or having another husband. So um, I I don't have that um, shame, guilt, or embarrassment because um, it's the best thing that ever happened to me, uh, becoming an alcoholic, because finally, you know, alcohol for me is not the problem. It was the solution, right? Finally, I could... Finally, I, everything was sparkly and shiny. There wasn't anything that wasn't sparkly and shiny. Not only that, but I, did, I didn't have to continue to look for it. It really did solve all my problems. Now, I'll tell you that it caused an awful lot of problems, but when you're drunk, the last thing that you're thinking about are your problems. Uh, we can always take care of those um, tomorrow, right? The bills need to be paid. I'm going to, that's too overwhelming for me to think about, so I'm going to drink and I will deal with that tomorrow but then tomorrow rolls up and we've already got alcohol in our system and um craving lasts for three days until alcohol is out of your system it takes three days for alcohol to get out of your system to at which point then if you're um you're no longer craving alcohol at that point it that is where when the obsession kicks in and so um I will be forever grateful for uh finally becoming an alcoholic and being able to finally find my solution uh, in alcohol because my life is, whew, I got to tell you, my life is phenomenal now. And ha had it not been for the um, program of Alcoholics Anonymous um, 
and being uh, shown by amazing group of women and grazing amazing group of men and uh, people that truly love me and wanted me to have what they had um, I would never have this amazing life that I have today I had no idea it was this good and um, you know I think uh, when I first started drinking that the when, you know, when I got drunk, um, it was the closest thing to a spiritual experience that I had ever had. And um, that was what I chased um, so many times was trying to have that spiritual experience again. Um, for me, um, you know, I grew up a uh, Christian and, um, you know, I got saved when I was two years old. I, I love the Lord. I love Jesus. And, um, but I never, I always had that in my head and, um, it never was in my heart. And I, and I have heard said before many times that the longest journey is the one from your head to your heart. And, um, it wasn't until, uh, I learned how to have a relationship with a higher power um, for me it's God um, that I had to quit or I got to I finally didn't have to look any further for or search anymore for God because um, I had found him through recovery wow um, that's very powerful and uh you know, to be able to, I guess, you know, you say this, a journey from your head to your heart, it's almost like this battle with your ego that you have and you, and you have to defeat your ego because your ego thinks it's, it knows what's best for you, but really, and your ego is kind of stu stuck in your mind. But if you could listen to your heart, that's when you can find true healing within yourself. Because I mean, there's got to have been like a trigger for you even before your choice of addiction had become alcohol, as you were saying before, have another baby, get married again, um, boys and sex. Like, do you feel like, can you think of like any triggers that you had that contributed to you um, seeking out these things, these things to cope with, um, your traumas does that make sense sure i don't i can't necessarily um say that there was anything specific that would have triggered that for me other than um you know growing up i and my mom gr grew up in um an alcoholic home i don't ever re remember my mom drinking but i do remember my mom being in uh 12 step programs and but i don't ever remember my mom drinking but um you know as i go through my journey and um even at four and a half years i'm not cured or fixed or um and more is revealed to me every day about who i am and um things things in my past you know things that uh, lead to a, a better um, knowledge knowledge of why. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't really think why is the most important thing. I think the solution, solution is probably the most important thing. But um, I know that, you know, my mom struggled her own self with how she was raised. And um, uh, my mom did the best that she could with the tools that she had. And her mom did the best that she could with the tools that she had. And so we can see these things being passed down from generation to generation until finally one generation decides that enough is enough and um, we can break that curse. And so Ems, I can't really tell you what the trigger was with all those other things other than I always felt like I was never a part of I wasn't pretty enough I wasn't funny enough nobody really liked me I never felt um what love was and you know and uh, another thing about um from your head to your heart you know we can know what we know right but we don't always we can't always feel what we know so I, you know, I don't know why I, I, I mean, I, I, I have said this many times. I know that that's the right thing, but I just don't feel it. 
I know that that's what I'm supposed to do, but I just don't know how to do it. I can't feel it. And mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't know if anybody else is like this, but I want to feel it. I mean, I don't care that I know it. I want to feel it because I want the warm fuzzy. I want to have the experience. I want to be in love all the time. I want to be, um, I want, I want that feeling all of the time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, all, you know, so that's what I was always searching for through food, through boys, through trying to find the next shiny thing was the feeling. Yeah, that makes sense. So you feel like drinking kind of, it, it enhanced you in some way, because you said you felt pretty, you could dance, you could sing, you could do these things. So it was kind of that enhancement to your life. Is that kind of what you were searching for? Well, the lie that alcohol told me was that I had finally arrived, I belong. Whether I mm. did or I didn't, I mean, I can tell you that there was a plenty of times I didn't where I was asked to leave or <laughs> escorted out or put to bed, uh, quote unquote, nicely or not. Or, um, you know, it, when I'm drunk, it doesn't feel like I'm the I'm making an ass out of myself or um, everybody's not having as good of a time as me. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, guys. Plus, to be perfectly honest, you know, when you're drunk, you really just don't give a fuck what anybody else says, thinks, or um, anything like that. Yeah, when I'm drunk, yeah. I'm I... like, woo, let's party. <laughs> also, yeah. I can concur. That's why I also had to stop drinking because I loved it too much. I was that bitch constantly, you know. I mean, I'm still that bitch, but that took me a while to get back to that, you know what I'm saying? Like, I was that bitch on command. And that's why I had to stop drinking because I loved it so much. It, it's honestly just it's a sickness, but I digress. I think I can only handle <laughs> so much of it though. Like, I get so sick. I also think I'm allergic to alcohol, but I still drink it sometimes. So, but I can get well, into that's that such a real time. thing. <laughs> yeah, no, what, that's being such allergic? A real thing I actually yeah, um, that's and that's like tying back into what we're talking about, and 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 I'll go back in the background. But um, I I have had actually quite a few friends um, throughout my um, wild days uh, who every time we would drink, like their chest would get just blotchy and red, and like they'd start itching. I'm like, dude, are you okay? Like, did you eat something? They're like, oh no, this happens every time I drink. But then like they were always like shot for shot with me. I'm like, bro, do we need to take you to hospital? I will stop drinking so I can sober up and take you to the hospital. But it's um like, but that's the thing. That's exactly why I said like it's a sickness because alcoholism is a sickness and it, the people that it affects do not care if they're allergic. You know what I'm saying? So that's just kind of like, well, that's me. Yeah. I get red in the chest and do I care? Nope. <laughs> well, but you, but you know, I, but no, no, no. I, I just want to make it clear. Like not every, you know what I mean? Like alcoholics, um, and recovering alcoholics. I mean, no matter what, if they're allergic or not, just is not an alcoholic. Um, not yet. Disrupt Productions <laughs> does not. <laughs> Disrupt Productions, um, stands by, uh, people who are in recovery or not in recovery, but I know for a fact that Jess is probably not something that we have to worry about. Anyway, I digress. This is about Miss Barb and Miss M. Yeah, but I sorry. just wanted to kind of tie that in. No, absolutely. I love the extra input. It's it's really great. But um I, you know, I have to agree there that, you know, some people do not react well to alcohol and it's interesting interesting to see um, I could get drunk and it would take me several days, like three days to recover. And I would have these horrible hangovers. And I just was like, man, I just, I, I can't give myself to that because I get so sick and I would rather be, I would rather be sober than experience being drunk because of the way that I would react to it after it's all over. And I'm just like, that's not good enough for me to, you know, experience that kind of a pain. And so I, you know, it was really interesting, Scotty, when we were talking about your story and you were saying that you were sick every day, like you didn't remember not being sick anymore. Yeah. Mom, do you remember anything like that? Like when you were getting nearer to even like starting to like decide to seek recovery, like, were you 
sick, like physically sick on a regular basis? Oh boy. So, you know, remember I said I didn't start drinking till I was 37, but that doesn't mean that I'd never picked up a drink. I didn't really start drinking alcoholically, or I like to say professionally, because I think some shit's just funny. So when I said I didn't start drinking professionally, can I just tell you, um, just from uh, someone in recovery to another, um, humor is crucial, crucial, yes. or else what are you doing? Agreed. <laughs> That's right, sister. That's exactly right. You know, um, so, but that doesn't mean that I'd never picked up a drink before. And, you know, I had four kids really fast all within about 10 years and I nursed them all. So my opportunity for drinking was probably uh, really limited. I don't know what would have happened had I had more opportunities to drink, but I can remember um, drinking at a Christmas party or drinking at a New Year's Eve party or drinking at some special event. And I, I can tell you this, that it's never crossed my mind a, a reason or a purpose why anybody would drink other than to get drunk. So whenever I went into drinking, that was always the purpose. Um, you know, and growing up in, in Salt Lake, I don't live in Salt Lake anymore. I live in Washington State, but growing up in Salt Lake, um, alcohol isn't just, uh, it's just not readily available um, like it is here in Washington State. You know, we can get everything here and any um, alcohol percentage you could possibly imagine is right there at the grocery store. Um, but in Utah, you know, where if you wanted to, if you're just in the grocery store and you walk down the liquor aisle, I mean, for me, 3.25 beer, I don't know what it is now, but 3.25, I mean, that's a 30 pack of Coors Light for me to drink in order to get where I needed to go. Um, when I, when I lived there and I started drinking and, um, so, um, you know, going to the liquor store, uh, to get anything better than um, 3.25 Coors Light was an extra trip. And, but I will tell you, you know, it never crossed my mind, even on those rare occasions where I drink to get drunk every single time. It's not like I woke up the next day and I thought to myself, oh, I'm doing this again. I'm doing this again. Of course I was sick. Of course I didn't feel good. And I remember um, waking up the next day and needing to, everybody, we're having a pajama day, and it's cereal, and it, it's movie day, and, um, you know, it was like that. So, of course, there was recovery time. Now, as I got older, and when I started drinking professionally at 37, I figured out a way to solve that feeling of shittiness the next day, and that was, you pick up a drink again, right? And I remember um, at a certain point where I had to, um, I'd have to, put a note in my phone um, that said where I'd hid the bottle from the night before. And so I'd open up my phone and that note and I'd, then I'd be able to go find it and I'd take it right to the bathroom and I'd have that first swallow and fuck me. I'd have to look in the mirror and I, this is what I'd say to myself. Come on, girl. You got this. You can do it. Come on. You can keep this down. You can do it. You can do it. And there, and if I was going to brush my teeth before I had my first few shots, we were going to be in big trouble because it, it, in edit, inevitably it was not going to be good um, had I, if I didn't have that. But I remember say, looking at myself in the mirror and say, come on, girl, you got this. You can keep it down. Just Let's just have the first one. Let's just take the first one. You're going to feel better. You know you're going to feel better. You see, these are the lies that alcohol tells us is have another one. You're going to feel better. Everything's going to be fine. All you need is a little hair of the dog. And one one shot for me leads to another, which leads to another, because I can tell you this right now. I was never content with the first one I had in front of me. What I was always worried about was the ones that followed up. And um, so I never could enjoy that first one that was in front of me. I was always ready and waiting with my dollars or whatever it was to make sure that I could have the, the next one and the one after that and the one after that. You know, in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a saying and it says one is too many and a thousand is not enough. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So <clears throat> one more question I want to have for you. I want to ask you before um, we close out this episode, can you describe alcohol in one word. No, that's not very fair, Emily. You could have given me uh, 
heads up that there was going to be this one question where I had to think of <laughs> <one> word. <laughs> um, so um, alcoholism in one word, if you don't put a space in between these two words, it makes one word and it's incomprehensible demoralization. That's powerful. Wow. Well, well, I didn't make it up. I did. I did read it in the big book, but it so resonated with me. You could have fooled um, me. Incomprehensible, <laughs> well, <laughs> incomprehensible demoralization. No one else would have. And known. I had to get to that place before. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Ta-da! I really made that up. Don't tell anybody. In AA. I will not tell a soul. <laughs> um, I was gonna see if, and I'm sorry. I just wanted to maybe chime in for a second because I took notes. Please ask your daughter and our amazing producer. Like I, if I don't take notes, it doesn't exist. So I <laughs> wanted to get the most out of this. There's a couple things that I wanted to like just share with you about my experience listening to you, if that's okay. I Whether or not sure. we, we have to cut this is totally fine with me. I just want to um, give you the respect and like the courtesy that you deserve. And so I want Aww. to, um, <clears throat> I guess I have like a, maybe a couple of questions. I won't take up too much time because I will discipline myself right now because I will, I will take up all your time. Um, <laughs> okay, baby. But, um, so it sounds like, um, now not making it about me, but the reason why I'm asking this is because, um, I'm, I'm in recovery as well. And, um, I did, I guess, other things besides AA. So when there's someone who is in AA, I'm just like, oh my gosh, do you love it? Like, what's your favorite thing? So that's kind of what I want to ask of you. Why AA? And um, are you enjoying it? Like, how is your experience? Like, is it a weekly thing, a daily thing? Okay, I'm so excited. I could hardly wait for you to quit at talking because I'm so excited Me to share to yeah. share this part with you. So, okay, so um, when I was in, uh, before I was even close to getting to a place where I was willing to uh, consider stopping, um, my mom would take me to an AA meeting and, um, you know, she just finally caught me and just trying something, you know, my mom, my my mom, bless her heart. I, I won't actually, I'm not going to say any, anything more about my mom because she's got her own story and her own journey to share. And I, I will give her the respect of um, that at her own time, if she so chooses to do. But my mom would, my mom and my oldest son, when I moved out here to Washington, um, I mean, I was a diehard drinker for the love of God. I mean, I would I smelled like it, you know, I woke up smelling like it. And I remember getting in the car with my mom and she'd say, my God, yep. did you even take a shower? And I said, yes, you know, and it's just seeping out of my pores. And um, so finally, um, I think she talked me into going to an AA meeting and I did not want to go to an AA meeting, but I was living with my mom at the time. And so she got you. Um, yeah, she, so get off my ass and let's go to yeah. a fucking AA meeting. And so I walked into this AA meeting and um, I probably wasn't sober. And I remember sitting in this room with a bunch of fucking old men who would, you know, I've been sober for 25 years and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to myself, I am not coming to these fucking meetings for 25 years. Why would I want to go to the A&A? &A, right. right? I do not want to go to the A&A. &A. And so those meetings wouldn't last very long for me, but clearly I was never at a I was not at that place where I had admitted incomprehensible demoralization, right? I was not there yet. Yeah. And so that didn't last very long. And I did end up in treatment. Um, I remember um, my counselor who helped me uh, get into treatment. And um, I knew that I had gotten to a place where I needed to stop. You know, I hadn't worked for a good year and I was with a, a man who um, needed me to work because he didn't and so yeah. <laughs> nobody paid rent for a while and I mean and I'm a pretty strong powerful woman I am oh I get that the, I get that from you I take I, I take care of all the business right if um, if you aren't doing it for me I, I don't need you to do it for me I can do it I can do it for me and I'll do it for us too because don't leave me love me Period. and yeah, um right right and so when I'd finally uh, uh, admitted defeat, I'd met a counselor who 
said, um, you know, it's going to be two weeks before we can get you into treatment, before we can get you a bed and, and you whatever know what? you do, don't stop drinking. I'm yeah. so sorry. I'm so sorry to interject, but this is something I will do when I get angry. This is part of the problem. We need more resources for people who are committed to treatment because two weeks is too long. Well, it is, but, you know, during that two weeks, it wasn't like I was just left on my own. He did say, whatever you do, don't stop drinking. Uh-huh. You'll have seizures. And yeah. Um, yeah. I re- and I used to see him three times a week, and I oh, even but- made him go get my boyfriend and say, um, tell him whatever <laughs> I do, don't stop drinking. Mm-hmm. And my boyfriend at the time, I'll, he was a, you know, there are different types of alcoholics. There's binge drinkers, and there's... Um, full-blown alcoholics like myself and I'm not saying that uh that uh, there's just different types of alcoholics but that that boyfriend happened to be a binge drinker and you know when he'd have a a night or a weekend of partying and he had a hangover fuck drinking for him he was not gonna do it but I'll tell you what when it was game on it was game on and that's so important to mention too because there are different types of drinkers and people don't realize, I mean, the, the thought of alcoholism, at least for me, because I love what you said, that's in my notes, like speaking for yourself, because we do tend to like what I'm doing now, speak in generalizations because it's further away from you, but accountability and recovery is about being like, no, I, you know what I mean? So that was a very powerful thing to remind me of. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things, especially, you know, you see, I mean, even, people around, um, like my age or like, you know, like, like the millennials, the Gen Z's, even the Gen Y's, like things like that. Um, if you go out and you party during the weekend and just, you know, pounding as many, you know, drinks as possible because you're, um, responsible Monday through Friday, not drinking, that still could be a major concern. So I love that you brought that up because that is a rhetoric that people need to have more. Well, if we think about what a normal drinker is, number one, a normal drinker doesn't drink to get drunk, right? Right. A normal drinker doesn't think, um, they don't think about alcohol the way that we do. They don't think about the next one and the next one and the next one. Does that mean that they never get drunk? I don't, I don't think that that's true. I think that they can definitely over drink, but they don't drink like we do. And, um, so I do, I think that that is a valid, a valid point that there are the weekend dr- drunk drinkers and there's the binge drinkers and there's the everyday drinkers and there, you know, there are, there really are just different types, but I think really what it all boils down to is what's your relationship with alcohol? Right. 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 Well, and is that something you that AA taught you that where it was like, take a, take a look like, you know, because AA is so important for people who are, you know, commit and like want to go and like are, are feeling it, you know what I mean? And, and some people are like, oh, I can do this on, on my own or whatever. And sometimes they can't. So it's really good to like, like what you said, quote unquote, admit defeat. Um, so it's, is that something that maybe like AA taught you or was that kind of a thought that crept up on you before AA? No, the only thought I ever had um, before AA was where to get my next drink and it's all about me. And so um, that's definitely something um, that I did learn in AA. And it, it is in the in the big book um, of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, different types of drinkers. And we do have, you know, the only qualification um, for membership in Alcoholics Anonymous is a desire to stop drinking. That is it. Mm-hmm. There's no a level of, uh, what's your level of alcoholism on a scale of one to 10, and then you get to go to AA. It is not that at all. It's a desire to quit drinking. Mm-hmm. Now, how deep do you want to get in the program? And what do you want to get out of it? Well, let's figure out what type of alcoholic you are. Right. Right. No, I, I completely agree. And I think um, with the next episode, I think I want to ask like more of these recovery questions, but I think it was so important to talk about too, because the first time you went, you, it, it seems like you were active, like within your addiction. So um, I, I mean, that, that's also a rhetoric. Guess what? People go to AA who are probably drunk and that doesn't mean that you're, you oh, know, yeah, yeah, you bet. I'll tell you when I went, when I, um, you know, when I remember that I had gone to treatment and I was sober for six months and decided I was cured. Mm -hmm. And then I started drinking again. And I'll tell you why I started drinking again was because I quit going to AA meetings, right? I quit doing the work that I needed to um, get rid of the guilt, the shame, 
um, all of those things, uh, resentments, discontentment, uh, lies, all of the shit that I had and the dis destruction, the wake of destruction I had left yeah. um, in my path after drinking. And so I had quit all of that and I got cured. And um, what in the fuck was the question? <laughs> I guess it was, like, yeah, it was for the one question for now, like just about like what was – um, like why was AA something that initially helped you within recovery? Cause that's a giant leap from like, you know, being a, a, like actively within. Okay. Yes. That's right. <laughs> I remember. So I went to, when, before, when I saw the counselor and before I went to treat and I was waiting for my bed and treatment, the first thing I said to him was, I don't want, I, I, I'm not going to a treatment center that's, um, AA. I'm, I don't want to do it. And he said, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> and it's, it, it, it's all 12 step based. Yeah. All right. And, um, so then I went to treatment and every night we had panels come in from, um, AA groups, uh, around the city and they would, uh, you know, in a panels like anywhere from, oh, I don't know, five to 10, um, recovered alcoholics who are coming in to talk about their experience, strength, and hope. And, and this is what they said. Um, go to meetings, get a sponsor, do the work. Go to meetings, get a sponsor, do the work. And here I am listening to these people's stories. And my and I'm bawling and I'm all like, holy fuck, that's me. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really touching me. And, and go to meetings, get a sponsor, do the work. And so I didn't know anything. I, I got out of treatment. First place I went to a meeting. Mm -hmm. A first lady I saw became my sponsor. And I'm meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. Mm -hmm. Meeting, 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 meeting. Because what I also knew at that point was that I was not going to be able to do this on my own. Sure. It was going to take a group of other alcoholics that were going to help me learn why and how to not drink anymore. Yeah. And, um, you know, because treatment doesn't, uh, treatment for me was an awesome, um, I needed to be physically removed from the, be, the option of being able to buy it or drink it. So treatment was amazing for me for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, but once I got out, I, um, so that's, so, so that, that had been, um, said to me, and you want, and to be perfectly honest, I'm listening to these people's stories. I fucking want what they got. Yeah. I want what they got. Right. And so it was very attractive. They didn't promote it. It was so attractive. Mm -hmm. I wanted that. And here were these kids, you know, they, and they were, they all had this camaraderie and they were, and they loved each other. You could see it. And yeah. I just wanted that. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and I'm going to, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it right back to you. I think, um, just especially with, within this addiction episode, um, I mean, number, you know, number one, first and foremost, your vulnerability is very courageous and brave and motivating. Mm -hmm. And I super appreciate that just from the bottom of my heart personally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I also want to make sure, um, just giving it back to M. Um, you know, being active in addiction, um, more than likely there are, um, relapses constantly. Um, and that is something that does come with, it is very extremely, I will never say never. It is very rare for someone to just be like, Hey, I'm done and be an active addiction. Um, you know, relapse is a part of, of recovery and addiction. That's kind of like how you bridge that gap a little bit. So, um, so thank you for your vulnerability. I'm going to give it back to M. Um, so anyway, um, th thank you both. And, and I love both of you and I love, sh sh you know, you sharing your story about, about your journey. It it's very touching. Oh, thank you so much. And just one, um, just really quickly to touch on relapse. Um, it is a, um, it does, it, it is a part of a lot of people's journey but relapse does not have to be right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story and um, especially talking on um, what led you down the road to addiction in our next part. Uh, you know, we'd love to talk to you about um, more specifics about your road to recovery 
and uh, what that has looked like. So everybody, please stay tuned for our next part of this. And thank you so much for coming. Yep. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Barb, thank you so much for being so vulnerable and telling your addiction story. Um, I just want to let everybody know that we do have a Patreon for all things bunk. Episodes are ad-free at our lowest tier, which is starting at only $5. Um, so if you want even more of the Disrupt crew, check us out on our Patreon at the $10 and $20 level for weekly episodes to help you celebrate your Sunday fun day every single Sunday. These levels also receive bonus benefits, such as 10 to 20% off every single merch order placed through our official Disrupt shop, which is coming in August 2022. Look out for that. Um, and that's officially it for us to today, you guys. Um, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, leave a review, share with your loved ones, your neighbors, anyone and everyone that you think would give us a fair shot. We love all of you for listening. And if you have anything that you would love to send to us, please send in to disruptcrew at scottytom.com. We love you guys. Thank you. Thank you Ms. Thanks Barb. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Big smooches. Bye.